going to welcome you to Candy's Dirt. We do this once in a while. We've been doing Zooms. I'm here with um, Adam Lampert, who is the CEO, the owner and CEO of um, both Cambridge and Manchester Care Homes, correct? That's correct. Yes. And how long have you been uh, in this the this business? Is it, we call it the uh, care, the home care business, or what is the right term for it? So we have, of course, two units. One, Manchester Care Homes, is assisted living, mm -hmm. uh, considered uh, type B small assisted living. We've been an operator for 12 years. And we, as we're coming from Manchester, we grew Cambridge out of the ground because when we were full with Manchester, we had clients who said, I still need a place for mom. And so we started staff out to homes, and that was the genesis of Cambridge Caregivers. Cambridge is about six years old, five years old. And Cambridge Caregivers, so that's where you can bring someone, you can hire one of your vetted, qualified, talented, professional employees to come into the private home and take care of your loved one or your parent, your senior, your spouse. <clears throat> that's exactly right. And and you, you make the point, but it's, it's, it's worth repeating that every single staff person is a full-time W-2 employee and they have long tenure with us. We know that that's the, the foundation of both businesses is our staff and uh, they're superb. So you really do get an exceptional individual coming to your home. And I will say that that is the thing that in my opinion puts your business above all the others is because you do, I mean, I've had experience with employees we all have and we know that there's a difference. And when you have full-time employees that you have known for a long time, you know their families, you know their background, it makes a huge difference. And we're talking about a business here where this is people to people contact. So it's very, very important. Well, we certainly had something change all of our lives in, in our this, this 2020. Yesterday we were doing an event and there was a, a home that had a sweat lodge and I became acquainted with sweat lodges and I've decided that yeah, what a sweat lodge is, it's this, this thing you go into and you burn, it's, it's an Indian tradition and you go in there mm -hmm. and they burn stones and steam and, and you let all the bad spirits out. And I'm like, oh my God, everyone should have a sweat lodge in 2020. Right. We all need to go into these and <laughs> just burn out all this bad juju that came our way. It was kind of like everything happened this year. Awful. But um, we've been in this now for seven months. What what did you do at the very beginning in March, you know, in your homes? I'm sure you were on, like you said, sleepless nights and, and total alert. What did you, what was the first thing you did? Well, uh, frankly, there was a lot of fear, right? And, and, and not, not just our residents, probably the least amount of fear. Our staff were very fearful. Uh, people who were going home to their families. Uh, we, we did a lot of education. Uh, there were a lot of operational things that we did we believe we were, we know we were ahead of the curve in terms of closing our doors to visitors, uh, not allowing even uh, the, the, the type of caregivers like hospice to come into our homes. We simply didn't allow them to come into the homes. And we, we, we did around, you know, we, we did a strategic group uh, uh, of our management and sat around a circle and said, here's our challenge. You know, everybody represents risk, including myself, you know, as the owner of the company. Mm -hmm. and since March, I've not been in a single one of our homes. And the reason is simply because the residents in those homes don't need the exposure of me for the sake of me saying that I'm in my home. So when we looked at our business that way, we, we looked at trying to mitigate risk. Uh, and what do we do in our business to mitigate risk so that our residents don't get sick? And so, for instance, we wanted to limit the number, the, the amount of interaction between the number of our staff and our residents. And so we changed from eight hour shifts to 12 hour shifts. Why would we do that? So that during the normal waking hours of one of our residents, there was only one person who was primarily having their hands on those residents. And so what we did was we effectively reduced staffing. We didn't, there's not a single person that we cut and we're committed to our staff and we made certain everybody had a full-time job. But what we did was we changed how they work so that we would limit the exposure of our residents. Uh, another prime example is we have, we have a lot of, uh, our, our ratios are exceptional. And uh, on, on, at any moment, we're four to one, every moment, I should say, 24 seven, we are a four to one ratio, which is exceptional. But during the day, 
uh, we have staff dedicated in our homes. And so for instance, we'll have three people on for eight people. Mm -hmm. And what we did was where we have uh, what uh, our, our, uh, our trainers or, or super managers, if you will, instead of having them float between the houses, we dedicated them to individual homes. Oh, mm -hmm. and, and as a result of doing that, we, we just reset what their responsibilities were. And, and the, the reason has a lot to do, again, this was all encompassing in how it changed how we operate. But when we kicked out, uh, and, and I, don't, I don't mean to say that we kicked people out, but when we didn't allow, and when we didn't allow uh, entertainment to come into the homes, and when we didn't allow the woman who cuts hair to come into the homes, we had to substitute for that. And so we did that by bringing staff on whose primary role, period, was engagement because for seniors engagement is so important. And so we found on, on, for every single resident in our homes, we have individual engagement for them instead of just having someone who plays accordion, we were engaging with every individual. So we, we really had to change our playbook in terms of how we operate in order to mitigate risk and to keep this virus out of the homes. That, talk about pivot, right? I mean, it was like a pirouette. You know? It was That's huge. Right. You had to change your whole business model. Um, how have your policies changed over the course of this? I guess what are seven months now? God, seven months. Uh, have you, you know, have you tweaked some of them? Have you given up some? Or <clears throat> well, you know, so so I think one of the things that really set us apart is that. The, the, the families that bring their loved ones to us, mm -hmm. they love these people dearly. And I will tell you, prior to COVID, we have families in our homes every day, every day. That's how they feel about their loved one. The biggest shock to our uh, universe at, at, at Manchester was the fact that families couldn't come in any longer. Yeah. Strictly forbidden. And so that was a huge change in terms of how uh, you know, we ran our business. And by the way, as we speak, that's changing. This is the first week uh, that we've allowed extended visitation where our family members can in fact put their hands on and hug their loved one, which they've not been able to do since the beginning of this pandemic. Unbelievable. So we are learning how to deal with that because we are still very controlling in the sense that we're protective of our residents and we want to be certain that, you know, our families, just like when we speak to our staff and we're like, be so aware when you go home, it's, it's not just about what you do at our, in the office, so to speak, but when you go home, what are your kids doing? What is your spouse doing? What are you doing to protect yourselves? Right. You bring that to us. And it's the same way with the families. So this is the driver uh, today, you know, is thinking about the effects of COVID you know, on our business and, and communicating to the families how important it is for them to be protective of their loved one and other residents in our homes. Um, and so, but we're modifying. And we had the most beautiful setup last week where um, a gentleman brought dinner, like a surf and turf dinner to mom. And they had this beautiful dinner out in the backyard, Aww. probably 12 feet at both ends of a long table with a candle in the middle and you know we had our staff serving them uh it was just beautiful but that's the pivot the pirouette uh is is learning is is the silver lining in in what was otherwise a dark cloud and that's so great now when they come do you they make them wash their hands you making them put on hazmat suits or anything like that or so we we have of course we know who's coming into our homes right. we know the families really well so mm -hmm. it's not these are strangers coming into our homes. These are people who we have constant conversation with about their, their own personal hygiene and how to stay clean. Mm -hmm. But when we come in, we follow all the regulations for the city and the state and the county in terms of asking them where they've been and what they've done and taking their temperature and washing their hands. Uh, we manage, we bring people into uh, a room that we've dedicated for visitation. And uh, it's unique in that we create airflow through the room. Oh, never standing air in the room. Uh, this is, you know, tantamount to being outside, but, you know, we have a fan and windows and we draw air through the room. 
and we waste a lot of air conditioning, but the effect is that there's, there's no, you know, air that stays around so long uh, that it could be infectious. That is so key because that airflow is very important. That's what you, all the experts say. It's when you're in the small enclosed areas without the airflow is when you're at highest risk. That's right. So, so the families are really good at, at following the rules. Uh, you know, they're very, they are so appreciative of the change in the rules this week and the ability to come in. They know, look, we want them in our homes. We love when families are in our homes. They're engaging with their loved ones. We want that. Candidly, we want, we want hospice in our homes. We want all the support personnel in our homes. It costs us money not to have them in our homes because we're substituting for them ourselves. But we just had to make, a con even today, you know, uh, that we changed our protocol in that, for instance, hospice, instead of physically coming to our property, they do Zoom calls like this. Um, and we do FaceTime uh, with, with the residents and with their families. That's a huge difference, by the way, I never knew Zoom uh, before this pandemic, uh, and now- We love it, don't we? <laughs> I love it and live it, and so do our families, yeah. um, and, uh, and so do our vendors. And so our vendors have leveraged it so that our registered nurse can be in the home and on the other end of the Zoom call with the caregiver, uh, hospice or otherwise, to work with the resident. So that has been a, a huge change, and one, by the way, that will survive the pandemic. I was going to say, yeah, um, you had zero issues or cases of COVID, which is pretty unprecedented and probably worth a headline in the Dallas Morning News or the New York Times because you were in the highest risk business there, you know, you know, creating elderly, ill, immunocompromised people that you take care of. How did, how did you do that? It's a combination of everything you and I have been speaking of wow. these last couple minutes is that we are in, in, I got to tell you, I mean, it, it is about sleepless nights because it's what keeps me up at night. But the fact is we've had not a single resident become ill, nor a single one of our staff in our homes uh, has become ill with this disease. And statistically that shouldn't be, but think that because we reinforce with our staff every week, how important it is, what what happens at home for instance if our staff if they feel like they have a cough if they feel if, certainly if they have a fever any of the obvious symptoms but if their child has a fever we tell them to stay home yeah. you've had countless staff who we say look stay home we're the, the most fortunate thing is the family leave act which has been critical uh to our ability to tell staff you do not need to take this risk go home will pay you to go home mm -hmm. and come back when, when you get a pass. And so we've, we have tested uh, our staff countless times when, whenever someone in their family has been sick and there's never been a case um, in, in any of their families. And I give our staff a lot of credit because at the end of the day, Candy, you and I go home and we have our, our loved ones and our family and we do our thing. And I can't control where, where you go or what you do. Right. Hours. And so it's really a matter of, you know, staff recognizing the gravity of their actions and, and helping to keep the disease out of our house. Exactly. And um, I know about midway through all this COVID stuff, there was a story about a nurse who went to a, a party and, you know, realized that she was a nurse and was just hospital and somewhere in the Northeast and, you know, realized that her responsibility was that she was really hurting her patients, her job, the whole hospital, letting her profession down just by that one move of going to that party where she could have gotten infected and maybe been an asymptomatic, but brought it back. And that's the way we all have to start thinking now, especially when you have loved ones in, in care with, with a company like yours. So it is. At the foundation of all of this, and you make the point about this nurse, the foundation of all of this is staff. And the culture in our business is to take care of our staff. The, 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 the culture is that we recognize the challenges that our staff go through. And I will just tell you, on any particular week, you know, we'll give out loans to staff, zero interest. Wow. And the reason we do this, and we fund cars every year for our staff, the reason we do this is because 
we know our staff are the face of our business. They're the ones with their hands on your mom or dad. And we don't want them thinking like what happened yesterday when our staff person said, my washing machine went out and needed a loan to buy a washing machine. Then we don't want them thinking about the broken washing machine and what are they going to do this week. We want them thinking about the care for your mom and your dad. And we know that we can eliminate a lot of that noise by being good operators and being supportive of our staff. So the foundation of our success is our staff and the, the fact that they're, they take the precautions that protect our company. I mean, from your lips to God's ears, my one of my whole things in this country is taking better care of employees and having companies recognize that. And I think that one important lesson I hope we've learned from this is don't tell people they have to come in when they're sick. Give them the respect of taking care of their family or taking care of themselves and not insisting that you work 24 hours a day, you know, 364 days of the year. I mean, people get sick, they're human, and they need to kind of pull back sometimes. Now, I think companies, boy, don't get me started. I think companies should all be like yours and take good care of their employees. That's how we did it in the 50s. That, that's right. You know, and, and I, I, I make that comparison a lot. But it, it is, if, if it's just, it's what I believe yesteryear was about, right? When companies looked out yes. for the people that were with them. And I got to tell you, Candy, my view of it is that if, my, if, if other people in the business don't do it, it just creates opportunity for us. Um, we treat our staff really well. We're growing a lot. We're looking for new every day. Yeah. We're looking for new staff. And the great thing is that we get staff, we attract them, and we maintain, you know, they stay with us because they like what we're about. And so we can only do that if we're respectful uh, of our staff and we give them a good place to work, a competitive rate, we pay their benefits, we do all these things that, um, that, that I believe as a business owner will only benefit the business on a long-term basis because we get tremendous reviews. But it's thinking long-term, not short-term. That's exactly right. So amazing. And I've been to your homes and they're spotless and they're beautiful and I'd move in tomorrow. <laughs> they're <laughs> terrific. Maybe I'll have to one of these days. Um, that, but the, we started talking about this a little bit before you touched on it. What are some of the changes you've implemented that you will keep going forward, like Zoom perhaps? Right. So certainly, uh, you know, this made us really look critically at how we engage with our residents. Because before COVID, the families were there to engage. We had entertainment that came in. I really like the fact that, and our, our families love the fact that we dedicate personnel to engage with their loved one. So they're not sitting around in, you know, in front of a TV. We want to engage with them wherever they are. We meet them where they are. Uh, and everybody's different. And that's exactly what we learned through this process. And it's something that I know we're gonna, we're gonna continue. In addition, the, the whole Zoom uh, uh, format is important for family members. I mean, a lot of family members are local and they live here and they visit here, but we have a lot that are from out of town and we never really engaged with them uh, on a FaceTime or, or Zoom call. Uh, and now that we're all expert at this, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're just better at it. So we will, we will absolutely leverage that on a go-forward basis. I think that's so great. And I think your, your director of engagement is a story that we're going to talk about in the future too. I think that's worth developing and telling the world about that you actually came out of this with a whole new position, <laughs> a whole new right. position for someone to do. And to, uh, because a lot of your residents probably are new to Facebook and they're pretty good if they can do it, but they probably don't know how to do Zoom and all that. So you have to have someone show them. Uh, you're spot on. And depending on where the elders are and, you know, what their attention span is and whether they understand, like you said, they're not used to talking to this screen in front of them. Right. Uh, and see, they see their kid, but they, they don't necessarily understand what's going on. Uh, you know, that could be my mother too, but you know, uh, but I mean, that's just how it is. So we're learning as we go. Uh, and we'll, we, we're definitely intent on implementing these ideas. Well, thank you. Well, we'll learn some more from you next month as we talk about what's ahead for the holidays and your loved ones who may be, and, and you don't just have 
elderly people, I mean, I say elderly, God, you know, I call myself geriatric mother now to my new puppy. I'm like, you have a geriatric mom, don't run so fast. You know? <laughs> but you have, um, you have people from all ages and, and walks of life who just need extra, extra care. That's it. Right. That, that's right. We, yeah. we, we are really a, a, a boutique operator. Now this is of course, talking on the Manchester side, we're a boutique operator in our business in that we, we deal mostly with people who have high needs. Uh, and if you have high needs, there's simply, there's just simply not a better place. Right. Uh, or I totally Cambridge, agree. that's right. And our, our Cambridge uh, staff, um, you know, again, it's all about the staff, but our Cambridge staff address people all across the spectrum of needs. They may have limited needs, meaning that they don't need a ton from us. Uh, we may help them get up in the morning. We may help them shower. We may get their breakfast going and then we leave. Uh, and uh, we may do the very same thing at the end of day. Uh, prepare dinner, get someone ready for bed, and then we leave. So the, the, the breadth of offering is it's much wider for Cambridge right. than, than it is for Manchester. Manchester. Well, that's great. We do wonderful work. We thank you for being with us so much. And we will just tell the story every month. And I look forward to talking with you or Brian or a representative from your one of your two fine companies every month. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Candy. Thank you.